How y'all doing? Arthur Scott. I'm just chilling today or whatever. I'm going to listen to the Book of Melchizedek while I play a video game. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to be sitting here anyway. But it's brand new. It ain't brand new. It's from the Dead Sea Scrolls. I had never heard it from before today. So it's brand new to me. I feel like there's good information in there. I'm not saying I'm advocating all of it. But I'm trying to get back into these studies, man. You know, I've been on my hiatus. So it's just a little warm-up. You know, just stretching it out type shit, you know? All right. My bad for cursing. <laughs> Let's get to it. Is a deck introduction. The Book of Melchizedek is an English translation of one of the Dead Sea Scrolls found in Cave Number 11, in the Qumran Desert, north of the Dead Sea. Some call it the Great Melchizedek Roll, since in its original state, it consists of a set of seven rolls sewn together. According to sources related to this Great Roll and what is read in the manuscript, the first scroll that appears in the compendium was written by Abraham, the same character we found in the Book of Genesis in the Bible. This scroll was recorded by Abraham's hand in obedience to Yahweh's divine mandate, and recounts the events that occurred long before and long after the great liberation that Yahweh made through Abraham and his shepherds, on that occasion when he was released Lot and the other captives who had been taken prisoner as a result of the battle recorded in Genesis chapter 14. This first story recorded by Abraham is known as the story of Avase. Abraham was also commanded to record the Salem story, which he would listen to and receive from the lips of Melchizedek, telling the most relevant events of that beloved city. Chapter 13 of Salem's story is a direct connection to the following story called the history of the universe, since in that chapter the context in which the revelation was received through the angel of light was explained. This history, we understand from the source, and as recorded in these roles, was written by Melchizedek and recorded in six rolls that were sewn one by one along with the first scroll written by Abraham. The history of the universe is a revelation that Melchizedek received through a luminous angel or angel of light, and which he was recording in those six scrolls for six years. The path that led us to the book of Melchizedek. Our history. We are researchers of the sacred writings for more than two decades, a work that we have done voluntarily and selflessly, because the main reason for getting involved in this mission lies in the genuine and unique value that the knowledge contained in these treasures of scripture represents for us. As we became familiar with this type of bibliography, we gradually learned some of the characteristics of these ancient writings. We began to unite parts of the human history of the earth, as these holy books reveal, and we realized that each of them provided us with a unique piece of valuable information that was helping us to assemble the puzzle of a more complete history of everything related to the human being, who he is, where he comes from and where he is going. By following in the footsteps of some important characters and events narrated in these writings, we recognize that these books have a limit of information about the story of certain characters and events. By having more scriptures, we were able to delve deeper into those same events and get to know those characters better, so that we have learned to recognize this fundamental principle, relate various sacred books in order to have a greater source of information to help us to reach a broader view on the topics contained in these writings. One of the important characters in sacred literature is Melchizedek, King of Salem. Because of the information we had about him, there was a strong desire in us to learn more about how he established peace in Salem. Also, another mystery that we had been looking for was related to music, because even at that time, before discovering the Melchizedek great role, our experience in music as a fundamental part to favor harmony between people, we understood that there was a mysterious past concerning the divine origins of music. One of the first words in the book of Melchizedek, which touched our musical heart, were The subjects of Salem would not wield bows and arrows, but they would be trained in musical art, each inhabitant of Salem would always have at his fingertips a musical instrument, to express through him the peace and joy of that new kingdom. Together, they would form a powerful orchestra in the fight against disharmony born of pride and selfishness. H. Salem 1, 4. We were amazed that what we had experienced and loved in our musical life, now the Eternal revealed us about a beautiful city and a unique town, where music was considered with such importance, and fundamental in the preservation of the peace of that kingdom. 
then we would find out in the history of the universe, about an even more ancient past, when the Creator idealized His creation so that He could vibrate harmonious chords of justice and peace, H. University 1, 2. One of the most important issues in our search for sacred knowledge, were the descendant of life or state before the foundation of this world, as well as the descendant during the fall of Adam and Eve, both related subjects, knowing we, that the broader knowledge of both issues could help us to understand more clearly our present and what will be in the future. Revelations, Mysteries, and Prophecies in the Book of Melchizedek Before and After the Book of Melchizedek After receiving and scrutinizing the contents of the Great Melchizedek Roll, and after a process of conversion to the new revelations that were being unveiled before our understanding, we experienced the reality that when this wonderful manuscript came to light, it was marking a point in the time, a before and after in human history, it will be possible to say, what was known before the book of Melchizedek came to light. And this we can testify because of the portion of knowledge that the Eternal had granted us to reach before finding the book of Melchizedek. Even today, all those who sincerely wish so, can verify this fact, by carefully observing what was known in the world regarding God's plan for his children, and making a simple comparison of what we can now know thanks to the appearance of the book of Melchizedek, thanks to the blessings that the Eternal grants us in this our generation by revealing more of his word. We understand from personal experience that the people who finally receive in their lives the book of Melchizedek as sacred scripture, will have reached it until after traveling a path of conversion to the additional light that the Creator reveals in this manuscript. I'm going to be real with y'all. I'm going to skip to the beginning of the story because this is all preface. You know, no disrespect to it. If you want to go back and check it out yourself, go ahead and hear all that preface. They say some good enlightening things. But I want to get to the missing scriptures because even though it's the book of Melchizedek, you don't even start jumping until Abraham. <laughs> so which they lead the flocks, instead of shields, they can the shepherds would be to take care of the flock until nightfall. For when I returned, I ordered that they tie the skeins of wool soaked in oil, on the tip of Okay. Even the same honorable priest as before. Yep, we write here. Commandment of Yahweh, writes in a scroll the events that gave rise to the history known as the history of a vase which tells the facts that framed the great liberation that the Lord made through Abraham, his pastors, and allies. See Chrono 1, 2, and 3. The History of Avase Chapter 1 Abraham is informed of the battle in which Lot and many are taken captive. Abraham receives commandments from the Eternal in order to effect the great liberation, that is, to summon and prepare his shepherds, and prepare Avase with special characteristics. One I was resting under the shadow of the Mamber Oak next to my tent, when I saw one of the servants of my nephew Lot arrive hurriedly. Almost out of breath, he began to tell me about the tragedy, there was a battle between the cities of the plains the day before, involving four kings against five. As a result, Sodom was defeated and many of its inhabitants taken captive, including my nephew Lot. The news left me very distressed because at the same time that I felt it was necessary to come out to his aid, I was fragile, without any conditions. Two I was always a peaceful man and I hate those who shed blood. I have many servants, but few know how to handle swords and spears, since childhood they have been trained as shepherds. Instead of swords and spears, they handle curbs with which they lead the flocks, instead of shields, they carry glasses on their waists, always full of fresh water, to kill their thirst and refresh the afflicted sheep, instead of wine to get drunk, they load subject to their belt small pots with olive oil, with which they anoint the wounds of the flock, instead of resonating trumpets, they blow in small horns, with which they summon the flock to the corral. 3. Imagining what a battle would be like between my servants and the armies of those five victorious kings, I began to laugh. While I was reflecting, the voice of the one who always guides me echoed in my ears, saying, For, Abram, Abram, do not disparage the instruments of the shepherds, for they are sanctified by the fire of sacrifice, they will conquer the great liberation. 5. The Eternal began to give me orders, making me advance by faith. Alright, 
this is one of the main reasons I'm even listening to this on my channel. If any of y'all the past viewers, y'all know the type of stuff I used to do on this channel. Going through the esoteric books, going through the spiritual comparisons, and a little bit of history. But, um, what's about to take place now, I don't know if they co copied it in the Bible. And that's the main reason I listen to the esoteric stuff to try to find who copied who, what happened when. I'm about to be mad because my car disappeared in the game. You see that. Anyway. Um... The make sure your candle has enough or make sure your lamp has enough oil and they followed Christ and that whole thing or however that junk was. I don't think it was Christ, but um, that's about to happen. Not involving the same people from the Bible and. Don't cast your pearls to swine. Never really had any reference for that phrase. Yeah, it's in the Bible, but ain't really no reference to, to why that's even a saying. To my knowledge, you know, and if so, it's just very lightly hinted to the point that ain't really had no significance to me. But this is at least a good explanation for why that saying would even have come about. So say about the next 20 minutes about to be popping and confusing, but popping without knowing how such liberation was to be realized. Six, the first uh. step was the convocation of all the shepherds who, leaving their flocks, went to the Mamre Oak bringing their pastoral instruments. There were a total of 600 pastors. Seven, I ordered the jugs to be emptied, placing the oil in the jar. Eight, after fulfilling this order, I asked that each one take the wool of a sheep, mixing it with the oil from the jugs. Nine, after these things, Yahweh commanded me to take a large vase of clay, filling it halfway with olive oil. Ten, at the end of this task, the Lord commanded me to make a long wick of wool, curling half in the oil and leaving the other part held on top of the vase. Eleven after these things, Yahweh yeah, ordered me that. to light the fuse, with the fire of the altar. As I approached the sacred fire that still burned on the morning sacrifice, a small flame jumped towards the fuse, and little by little it was feeding on the oil, until it became a flare that could be seen from afar. Chapter 2 Abraham carries the vase on his shoulders. Yeah, his old. Sufferings and trials in his journey. This junk is crazy. Many do not bear shame and abandon Abraham. Unbelief of Sarah. One with the vase on my shoulders, I started a walk towards the cities of the plain, being accompanied by the shepherds. Then mockers began to emerge that, seeing me with that incandescent vase in broad daylight, began to say that I was crazy. Incandescent. As this news spread, many came to meet me, bringing advice for me to abandon that base that would be able to destroy all my reputation and dignity in front of them all. Two, when I told them about the armies and about my joint mission with the shepherds, they concluded that in fact I was crazy. They tried to throw me the base by force, but holding onto it, I prevented them from throwing it at me. Three, embarrassed by all this, many pastors began to separate, some returned to their tents while others joined those who laughed at my strange behavior. For feeling alone with that heavy vase on my shoulders, I began to anguish myself. I longed to find someone with whom I could share my experience, but everyone gave me disapproving looks. 5. I remembered Sarah, my beloved wife, in obedience to the voice of Yahweh we had traveled many ways, being Sarah always by my side encouraging me to continue precisely in the most difficult moments certain just for reference voice came down to abraham we saying god the saying the voice that has always guided him told him to fill up his vase with oil or take the oil that he keeps or take the vase that he keeps oil in you know for his you know what they use oil for they anoint the wounds of the flock and do a bunch of junk with oil if you read did my car did disappear Okay. <laughs> Freaking. Yeah. Take your oil. Take a rope or a wick. Long one. Put it in the oil. Carry it. To save a lot. So you're carrying this into a battle with like four to five kings and their nations. You know, or the remnant of the battle that happened between four to five kings and their nations. But it's ending in Sodom and Gomorrah, you know the story from the Bible, where Abraham has to go save Lot. 
people clowning him. Take note that Abraham has pastors. There are other religious men besides Abraham. He is not the only. They clowning him. You tripping. I don't know what voice then came from where and told you to do that, but that ain't the move, player. He's hoping in his heart. I know who will have my back out of everybody. All these mockers and naysayers who believe that my word of God is false. Sarah got my back. If he is still Abram, then she shouldn't be Sarah yet. Just to get be on biblical track. She should be Sarai. She isn't Sarah until they leave Egypt. So I don't know where we at right there. But only Sarah would bring me comfort and strength to continue firm, leading the vase of salvation. Six while I was walking along the road thinking about Sarah, I saw her in the middle of the crowd. When I addressed her, I was surprised and discouraged to see in her eyes the same contempt of those who called me crazy for driving in the middle of the day the flame that had come off the altar. Sarah, come Seven, on. Seven remembering Yahweh's order that I would have to free my nephew Lot, I walked alone along the road. When I put myself in the place of those who called me crazy, I gave them the reason, because under normal conditions, no coherent person would leave the house, without a definite course, carrying a vase with a flare on the back, claiming to be marching against the armies of five kings, to free a relative. It really implies that it is the manifestation of great madness. Precisely so, under the grudge of all the humiliations and words that spoke against me, I was moving towards the unknown valley. Eight, all that mockery was finally diminishing, as I distanced myself from the Mamre Oak. Nine many doubts about my future began to come to my heart. He was sometimes afflicted with the thought of everything he had experienced, from the convocation of the shepherds until that moment, it could be, in fact, demonstrations of madness. Ten full of doubts, I began to think about the possibility of leaving the vase next to the road, returning to the altar. Those were the advice of some pastors and friends who, still in solitude, still came to meet me, advising me to return, there, they said, that I could again conquer the trust of the shepherds, returning to be, perhaps, even the same honorable priest as before. On the altar, they said, there was a fire much greater than the one I carried on my shoulders. 11 I was about to return, when Sarah came to meet me, telling me about the contempt that many pastors threw at me, she was dismayed, because all that dishonor, also fell on her, to the point of not feeling more desires to remain next to that altar. 12 After alerting me, Sarah began telling me about a plan, we could, perhaps, move to a distant city, where we would forget all those vexations. 13 no, Forgetting Bob. the voice that Thought had sent me no, on my way my to bad. the plane, I replied to my wife that I would be willing to accompany her anywhere, if she allowed me to take the vase. He would be our altar, eating and lighting our nights with his flame. 14 Upon hearing about the vase, Sarah became angry again, claiming not to understand my stubbornness by continuing to carry on her shoulders that symbol of shame and contempt. After telling me such words, he turned his back on me back to the store. Chapter 3 Abraham understands the meaning of the vase. Abraham protects the little flame from the cold wines. Many sheep follow Abraham. Abraham, walking alone, follows the trail. The armies mock Abraham and threaten the extermination of the captives. One distressed at not being able to realize Sarah's dream, I continued towards the uncertain future, being oriented only by the flame, whose brightness increased as the darkness grew denser. Then I began to meditate on that flame that accompanied me with its brightness and heat. Two I was used to seeing the sacred fire enthroned on a great altar of stones, in the midst of the praises of many pastors, among whom I stood out as a teacher and priest. In those moments of adoration, I dressed in the best mantles, and asked the question of making the sacrifice, only when all my servants were gathered around me, to listen to my advice and warnings. At the time of the sacrifice, I lifted my drawn sword to the sky, and, with frightening words, proclaimed the greatness of the Lord of Armies, the Almighty God who rules over heaven and earth. Vibrating the sword in the air in a menacing movement, I represented in front of my shepherds, the image of a severe God, 
who is always ready to repel any confrontation. After that demonstration of sovereignty and power, I took a sheep from the hands of a shepherd, and tied it on the altar. So that the divine wrath was very clear, I punctured on her neck, hitting her severely, until I saw her perish. At that moment I descended from the altar, and remained waiting for the sacred fire that never stopped manifesting itself on the sacrifice. 3. I had learned since childhood to revere the sacred fire, believing that it was a visible revelation of Yahweh, the great invisible God. Until then, I saw it as a unique and indivisible fire. Now, by transporting in a humble jar the flame that had come off the altar, my thoughts stirred with the emergence of a new concept about the Creator, the concept of a suffering God who is able to part with the great Yahweh, represented by the sacred fire, to accompany the sinner in his journey. For repentant, I've... That's one of them weird lines. Now, did it say a creator God separated from Yahweh? What the hell does that mean? I don't say Yahweh is God. I, I say, hey, yeah, hi, yeah, you know, um, but it still has the Yah in it. But Yahweh and all that other stuff supposedly is the negative aspect of that. So I don't know. That's just linguistics. But let me see what, what this thing is. I'm going to give it a... Uh. And priest. In those moments of adoration, I dressed in the best mantles and asked the question of making the sacrifice only when all my servants were gathered around me to listen to my advice and warnings. At the time of the sacrifice, I lifted my drawn sword to the sky and, with frightening words, proclaimed the greatness of the Lord of Armies, the Almighty God who rules over heaven and earth. Vibrating the sword in the air in a menacing movement, I represented in front of my shepherds, the image of a severe God, who is always ready to repel any confrontation. After that demonstration of sovereignty and power, I took a sheep from the hands of a shepherd and tied it on the altar. So that the divine wrath was very clear, I punctured on her neck, hitting her severely, until I saw her perish. Abraham At is that moment I descended from the altar, and remained waiting for the sacred fire that never stopped manifesting itself on the sacrifice. 3. I had learned since childhood to revere the sacred fire, believing that it was a visible revelation of Yahweh, the great invisible God. Believing. Until then, Didn't I saw say it, it was. as a unique and indivisible fire. Now. By transporting in a humble jar the flame that had come off the altar, my thoughts stirred with the emergence of a new concept about the Creator, the concept of a suffering God who is able to part with the great Yahweh, represented by the sacred fire, to accompany the sinner in his journey. Hmm. For repentant, I fell down in front of the vase and cried bitterly. I was now aware that all the zeal shown by the altar was aimed at the exaltation of my pride, and not the love of the one who accompanied me along the way. Five suddenly, I was reminded in my mind that the little flame that had come off the sacred fire, was a representation of the Messiah, who would part with the great Yahweh, to be the God with us, companion in all our journeys. Upon this conviction, the flame rejoiced, becoming brighter and hotter. Six with my heart transformed, I continued along the path to the valley, carrying on my shoulders the jug that had brought me after so much contempt the joy of a new revelation about the character of the Creator. Seven difficult moments began to emerge in my path, when cold winds from the salty sea started. began to lash out at the little flame, in an effort to extinguish it. I protected it with my body, walking many times on my side and also on my back, but always moving towards the valley. Eight when the daylight broke, I found myself one step away from the plain. I began to find many flocks along the way that were led by rude shepherds. As I moved between them, tumults and confusion arose, as many sheep and goats were scared with my burning vase, scattering everywhere. This made most of the pastors irritated against my presence in their midst. 9 Knowing that I could not remain held in that valley, I went straight on towards Sodom. As I progressed, something interesting began to happen, many sheep, tender and submissive, began to accompany me. They were few at first, but little by little their number was increasing, until I began to walk with difficulty, due to the large number of sheep that followed me. 
In the distance I could see the shepherds, enraged, for the loss of their prettiest sheep. 10 When I arrived at the city of Sodom, I found it empty and devastated. Following the trails left by the armies and the multitude of captives, I was getting closer and closer to the target of my mission. When I reached Dan's countryside, I could see the great soldiers camp in the distance, at the foot of a hill. Without hurry, I headed there, leading to my new flock. 11 From the top of the mountain, I could observe the camp in its entirety. There were thousands of soldiers commemorating their victory, meanwhile, hundreds of captives lay in the middle of the camp, humiliated and hopeless. Before that scene, I was imagining how the liberation could be realized. 12 My presence aroused the curiosity of some soldiers who, when they saw me with the fumigant face, approached and began to mock. When they asked me the reason for my presence in that place, I told them that I was coming to free my nephew Lot. My words became the reason for many jokes throughout the camp, after this, they began to mock Lot. 13 In a short time, all that mockery was transformed into cries of revenge, and they proclaimed that, the next morning, all the captives would be exterminated, starting with my nephew. So Chapter 4 Abraham is comforted by the arrival of his shepherds and allies. The shepherds learn to love the light of the vase. Loyalty of Abraham's allies. Guided by the divine voice, Abraham gives strategic instructions. Lot's lamp. Confusion and killing between the enemy armies. One while trying to imagine what Yahweh could do to achieve such a miraculous liberation, I saw a group of shepherds coming in my direction, coming from Sodom. I thought at the beginning that they were the enemy shepherds who came to pluck the flock conquered with love. Such distrust soon disappeared, giving rise to a feeling of great joy, when I discovered that they were my faithful pastors. They approached in small groups of twelve, reaching a total of three hundred pastors. Looking at them, I could see in their countenance the signs of a great spiritual struggle that they had to face, to be on my side. They told me about the experience of many colleagues who, discouraged, had thrown the oil and wool out of their glasses, returning to their tents. They told me about how, on that previous night, they had learned to love the light of my vase, which for them became like a guiding star. Two I was glad with the presence of my humble shepherds, when Arainur, Eskal and Manra arrived in the direction, accompanied by fifteen armed men, they were faithful friends who, knowing the dangers we would face in that valley, came to our aid. So that we would not postpone the divine plan, I asked them to remain hidden until dawn, when they would receive guidance on how to participate in the mission. 3 I began to orient the shepherds, following the instructions of the divine voice that sounded to me from within the flame, the first task of the shepherds would be to take care of the flock until nightfall. For when I returned, I ordered that they tie the skin. Didn't notice that last time, but apparently Moses ain't the only one hearing voices out of flames, burning bushes, etc. Gains Back of out. wool soaked in oil, on the tip of their curbs, placing them inside the glasses that should be kept suspended, face down. 5. I began to light them with the fire of my flare, until the 300 torches were burning, though, hidden, inside those vases. 6. I ordered 40 of my courageous shepherds who, at the time indicated by a sign that would be given, should advance silently towards the center of the camp, circling all the captives that lay in the middle of the troops' camp. At the same time, the remaining 260 shepherds should surround the entire camp, waiting for the signal to break the glasses with the horns. 7. Oriented by the voice of the flame, I indicated the signs, when the last torch went out in the camp, they should be attentive, since a small lamp would be lit by one of the captives. As soon as the lamp began to burn, everyone should run to their position, avoiding any noise, so as not to be discovered. 8. The signal for them to break the glasses with the horns, raising the torch very high, would be to extinguish the lamp. 9. After those orientations, the 260 shepherds, hidden by the shadows of the night, scattered throughout the valley, and were waiting for the moment to place themselves around the camp, meanwhile, the 40 were placed next to a more vulnerable passage, through which they would reach the captives. 
10 It was already late at night when the torch of the last soldier was extinguished, a complete darkness and silence over the troops' camp. 11 Among the captives, there was a man on that night, who lived the greatest anguish of his life. It was my nephew who, after becoming the target of so many abuses and humiliations, had learned of the punishment that awaited them at dawn. 12 On that night, Lot had his thoughts turned to his uncle, he remembered with regret the moment he had left me next to the Mamra Oak, moving to the Sodom countryside. In desperation, he felt the desire to see my face again and to apologize for having turned away from me. Just then, Lot was attracted by the glow of a torch burning on the hill. When he looked at the glow, he imagined he was having a vision, for it revealed the face of his dear uncle. 13 Wanting to show me his face, Lot felt in the midst of darkness until he found a small lamp he had brought in his saddlebag. Frustrated, he sensed that there was no oil in it. He concluded that the dry and dull lamp was a symbol of his empty and faithless life. Oh. 14 Without diverting his eyes from my face lit by the flame of the vase, <clears throat> in a desperate gesture of faith, Lot felt the wick of his lamp, discovering that there was an oil residue in it. Curving, he began to hurt the stones of the fire, until a spark jumped towards the fuse. Without knowing it, Lot was commanding with his gestures, the steps to a great liberation. I was about to say, ain't that the scene when the Lot 300 shepherds saw the dim glow of the lamp, they quickly headed towards their posts, and remained waiting to extinguish the small flame. 16 From the moment Lot got up with his tiny flame, I was looking into his eyes that looked at mine. I saw that his face brought signs of unspeakable anguish and ill-treatment. Likewise, I could read in his blue eyes that hope and faith had not yet left him. Blue eyes. 17 The little fire in Lot's lamp, however, would not resist for long. It was necessary to turn it off, to signal the great victory. 18 When darkness covered Lot's face again, my three hundred shepherds lashed their horns against the vases that kept burning torches hidden. A great noise, like cavalry in combat, echoed everywhere, while the torches were suspended. The three hundred horns used until then to lead the flock, now sounded like trumpets of conquerors. 19. The whole camp woke up Indiana one jump, and, not knowing how to escape from such a terrible investing that it started from the outside and inside, the soldiers began to fight among themselves, uh, okay, while my shepherds remained in their posts, sounding the horns. 20 The captives were very frightened at first, but little by little they became aware of the great liberation that was operating in their favor. 21 When it dawned, a scene of complete destruction was revealed before our eyes, the whole town was covered by thousands of bodies torn by their own swords and spears. Only a few managed to flee that death camp, but they were persecuted by my 18 allies who were armed, being reached in Hoba, which is to the left of Damascus. <coughs> Meanwhile, the captives, now released, recovered all the riches from which they had been looted by enemies. Chapter 5 Okay, so they're saying that um, using his numbers, he brought a small number to the interior who were triggered by Lot's candle, coincidentally, because Lot didn't know nothing about it. Um, so they're on the inside, the smaller amount, which I think is a hundred because he left 200, if I'm not mistaken, on the outer barriers. Now they all got horns and candles or whatever, you know, uh, when the candles lit, they know to b blow the horns out. All the troops of the enemy army is asleep. So now you got this real big trumpet sound on the interior by the camps and the sleeping men and echoing at a greater portion on the outside even though it's not really a whole lot of people it's just the placement <clears throat> he said he, he people awoke to men slain by their own swords so if you got small numbers got five kings worth of their armies y'all in a huddle and you create that confusion in the middle of the night that he's saying they slaughtered each other <laughs> Like, y'all stay low. If you raise your candle up high, you'll be seen, but also the candle will go out. So that's just common sense not to do that. But also, keep your candle low so you won't be seen. And they're going to be looking for any enemy nearby because them horns were so loud and they dead sleep. 
Hmm. Strategic. The great liberation represents the liberation of Israel in the last days. Abraham discovers that the great liberation was concretized in Rosh Hashanah. Abraham Rosh Hashanah. preaches the faith in the Messiah to the liberated captives inviting them to purify themselves in water, only three accept him. Abraham rejects the offer of the king of Sodom. Abraham and the faithful decide to commemorate the festival of Sukkot in Salem. Sukkot. The pearls of the Why base. Festive welcome in Salem. The meeting of Abraham and Melchizedek. See Chrono 1, 2, and 3. One from the top of the hill, while I vibrated with the joy of the captives on that morning of liberation, I heard the voice of Yahweh speaking to me in the middle of the flame. Mm. 2. A. This liberation that is concretized <clears throat> today, represents the liberation that I have to operate in the last days, saving the remnants of your children, from the siege of numerous nations that will ally themselves with Gog in order to destroy them. On that day when they triumph over my people, my indignation will be very great, and I will contend against it through the plague and the blood, flooding rain, great rocks of hail, fire, and brimstone I will make fall on him, on his troops and on his many towns that were with him. Thus, I will magnify myself, justify my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. And on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem I will pour out the spirit of thanks and supplications, they will look at me whom they pierced, and will lament as one who laments for an only begotten son and will cry for him as one who cries <coughs> bitterly for the firstborn. On that day, there will be an open source for David's house and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to remove sin and impurity. 3. Aware of the historical importance of that day of liberation, I took a calendar and looked with surprise, for it was Rosh Hashanah, or Trumpet Day. That was the first day of the New Year. Trumpets. Ten days later the Yom Kippur would come, the day of the purification of sins, on the 15th, the Sukkot party, the joyous autumn harvest party, would take place. For the flame that for me had become a representation of the promised Messiah, went out the moment I descended to meet the shepherds and the many captives now released. Full of joy and admiration, Everyone wanted to know how such a great liberation had become possible, only with the use of those torches and horns. I told them then about the importance of that fire that had been released from the altar, to free them in that valley, identifying it as the Savior Messiah. 5. Seeing that everyone carried the dirt of slavery in their bodies and mantles, I invited them to follow me to the Jordan River, where everyone could bathe, for the purification of their sins. Six only three people attended the invitation, Lot and his two most recent daughters. The others returned what contaminated to, to their homes. Seven before leaving, the king of Sodom came to meet me, promising to give me all the wealth recovered that morning. I rejected his offer, so that someone... I'm sorry, y'all know what happened with Lot and his two daughters, right? Well, it's interesting um, how this play out. And then supposedly what happens in the future, what we know would happen with Lot and his two daughters. Don't be drinking that wine, y'all. I could never say that I enriched myself with that plunder. 8. We stayed camped on the banks of the Jordan River, near Jericho for 12 days. In those days of refreshment, everyone was free of impurities, leaving them in the waters of the Jordan. This was a special preparation for the Sukkot party that we decided to commemorate in Salem. 9. Full of joy. We started an upward march towards the city of Salem, unaware of the happy surprise that awaited us. I was still at the front with Lot and his two daughters by my side, and behind the three hundred shepherds came, leading the great flock. Ten as we moved forward, I began to notice that my vase that had become empty at dawn became very heavy. As I lowered it, I looked surprised to discover within it many pearls of various sizes and glitters that mysteriously formed. 11. When we see the white city in the distance, we begin to hear sounds of a great party. Harmonious chords reverberated through the mountains, as we advanced along the road. 12. My curiosity in knowing that city and its young king was immense. The jar that he had the oil in for this whole endeavor, he's bringing back, telling people the story on the way. Uh, and somehow, in between where he got to go, and where he coming from 
he bumps into another kingdom. But um, what was it? Oh, he notices the oil's gone. And there's pearls there now. So I'm thinking one of the Sodom and Gomorrah people was like, oh, you taking something. <laughs> you ain't just about to do all that good and walk away like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you heard what Abraham said? No, nah, they ain't going to say I got rich up off of them. Mm -mm, I'm my own man. The king was like, nah, you taking something. <laughs> Put them pearls in his, in his jar. <laughs> because from the mouth of many I had already heard about its greatness and fame. It was a kingdom different from all the others, where subjects were trained not in the handling of bows and arrows, but in the domain of musical instruments. Melchizedek, his young king, ruled everyone with a very special scepter, a lute, for which he had paid a high price. Thirteen as the joy grew in me as we approached the city of the great king, we saw a crowd dressed in fine linen, pure and shining, coming out to meet us. They all brought musical instruments, while singing a victory hymn. In front of the crowd came a young man playing a lute, bringing a crown full of precious stones on his forehead, which shone under the clarity of the setting sun. I was certain that this was the acclaimed king of Salem. Fourteen at the time of our meeting, we were admired with the salutation they gave us, leaning in front of me, Melchizedek said. Fifteen A blessed are you Abraham, servant of the Most High God, who possesses the heavens and the earth, and blessed be the Most High God who delivered your adversaries into your hands. Chapter 6 Great Revelations of Melchizedek and His People The victors are crowned. Upon being crowned, Abraham is moved to observe deep wounds in the hands of Melchizedek. Melchizedek promises to tell his story. Melchizedek, by breaking bread and wine, is honored. The 144 pearls as tithe. The Instructions and Prophecies of Melchizedek Once surprised by the festive reception, we were introduced to the city, where the beauty of the mansions and gardens caused us much admiration. Abraham got crowned. Just want to mention that. They're going to tell it again. But, yeah, Abraham was a king. You know, they make him simple all through the Bible and this, that, and the other. But I'm saying, but I'm kind of back in that even though I'm you know still skeptical about this literature but it's still you know it's all information whatever um <clears throat> I had heard in many ways that Abraham is a king and how could Abraham defeat many kings and not become a king maybe not in his own heart he's humble he's a humble man of God so he probably ain't throwing it up in God face or nothing like that so you might not hear it coming out, out his mouth too much but we know by the time Abraham died he got land on top of land covered and a lot of people come to his funeral. Kings come to his funeral from distant lands. And all they say is, oh, he was a holy man of God. But Abraham getting king treatment. <laughs> you know, he got the special place where he, he gets buried or whatever. You know, uh, yeah. Abraham was a king. I kind of believe that one. Everything there was pure and full of peace. Two, we were received in the royal palace, built on Mount Zion. There, a new surprise awaited us. Three, the great throne room was all adorned with representations of our victory over enemies. There was a very long table in the middle of the room, covered by fine linen towels adorned with gold threads and precious stones. There were 304 crowns on the table, each bringing the inscription of a winner's name. In a gesture that surprised us again, Melchizedek, taking the crowns, began placing them on the head of each of us, starting with Lot and his daughters. We were all admired by the fact that the king of Salem knew us individually. Lot and his daughters are now kings and princesses. The, mo the mama dead. That's messed up. No, wait, 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 wait. Sodom and Gomorrah ain't been destroyed yet. So the mama's somewhere off. I don't know why the moms ain't there. Good question. They don't answer it. But, um, yeah, so I'm having a lot of thoughts. But <clears throat> Lot gets kinged, two daughters get princessed, but also means they're heirs or they're passing the heir. 
because Sodom and Gomorrah get destroyed. And if what they say happened between Lot and his two daughters it did happen between Lot and his two daughters, would that have made, give me a second. Ah, I know these names. What are their names? Dang, I forgot the the I forgot Lot's Lot's two sons' names, but you know the the children or whatever, and they become great nations that are said all through the Bible. And for some reason, I can't remember how said, who they are. Amorites, Ammon. I I feel like I'm wrong. I feel like the Moors come out of it. But that's just a whole nother thing. But also in the process, you get in that inbreed, inbreeding thing that you see within Egypt. You know, oh, they marry their daughter to keep the bloodline or they marry their sister to get the bloodline. Um, <clears throat> I'm just pointing out shit. I ain't saying what's what. <laughs> and by having those crowns ready long before we were victors. For I watched the joy of my crowned companions when taking a crown similar to his the king of Salem addressed me with a smile. As I lifted it over my head, I noticed something that I had not perceived until then, his hands brought deep wound scars. Overcome by a feeling of gratitude, I fell at his feet and, moved, kissed his kind hands, bathing them with my tears. Bathing Five when them. I got up, I asked him the meaning of those scars. With a tender smile, he promised that he would tell me the whole story of that prosperous kingdom, and how much it cost him to obtain his peace. Six after being crowned, Melchizedek made us sit around the great table, and began to serve us bread and wine, from that moment, we began to honor him as priest of the Most High God. Seven in a gesture of gratitude, I took the vase full of pearls, and placed it at the king's feet. Taking him in his arms, he began to caress him, without attempting to shine the pearls. Expressing gratitude for that offering, he told me that he would accept the vase and, that of the pearls, he would only accept tithing. 8. Immediately I began to count the jewels, separating the most beautiful for the king. There were a total of 1,440 pearls, of which I handed him 144. He carefully put them away in a little box made of pure gold, on whose lid... I'm pretty sure y'all already know the reference with the 144. Only 144,000 get into that or become the priest of heaven in Revelation. You know the story. This many from Judah, Ephraim, Manasseh, da da da. da. Uh, something else is coming, but I'll, I'll mention it in a second. It were beautiful ornaments inlaid with small precious stones. Nine after receiving the tithe that symbolized the great liberation operated by Yahweh in the plain. Melchizedek called to come to him one of his subjects who was a master in ornaments and paintings, ordering him to honor the vase with a beautiful engraving that portrayed the moment in which I offered it. 10. While the jug was painted, Melchizedek began telling me the story of his kingdom, from its foundation until that moment when we were commemorating the great victory over the enemies. 11. When I returned the vase, now honored with the most beautiful engraving and inscriptions that exalted justice, humility, and love, the king of Salem ordered me to take the vase with those pearls with me. For six years I and my pastors should tell everyone the story of that vase that was victorious because of the flame of the altar. To all those who, with repentance, accept the salvation represented by their history, we should offer a pearl. At the end of the six years, the pearls would be over there would be no chance of salvation. Then the seventh year would come, in which there would be a time of great anguish and destruction, when there would only be protection for those who possessed the pearls. By that occasion, the cities of the plain would be totally destroyed by the fire of the judgment, and the other towns that did not regret, would be decimated by great plagues. Chapter 7 The Revelations of Melchizedek Continue Events to be verified in Rosh Hashanah, in Yom Kippur, and in the Feast of Sukkot. They don't say Six it, but years of opportunity. don't cash your pearls to swine. The sanctification hey, of the Sabbath. I'm just trying to start a sign the process of covenant so with look Yahweh. Up, I want to look up. The New Jerusalem revealed at the end of seventh year the coming of the Messiah, the resurrection of the deceased faithful, and transformation of the victorious living coronation of the righteous in the holy city. See Chrono 3. All right. <clears throat> 
I looked I looked it up earlier. I couldn't really find nothing that sparked in my mind. But Melchizedek made one of his famed artists or this, that, and the other um, come commemorate the event on a vase to celebrate the great victory. So I was looking up the victory. Maybe I should put Abraham in the title. Abraham, maybe. Oh, no, right. Let me see what's on that one. I don't want to put Abraham all the way in there to start giving me pictures of Abraham. Ancient. That's what I was doing. Ancient. You can't see the engravings on so many of these. But I figured you'd be looking for anything that either looked like the battle. Let's see a trident. Um, they look like the battle or it looked like two kings, one bowing down to the other type stuff. Bunch of angels. Angel. I ain't gonna spend y'all. I ain't gonna spend a lot of time on this. See, wait. What am I looking at? I don't know what the chickens would have to do with anything. See, how would you commemorate that battle of Abraham? You know, and would that ancient vase still be in existence in any way, shape, or form? I have any record remaking or whatever. But anyway, y'all get time. Check that shit out. Maybe I'll find it before I do. One on the triumph we had just obtained over numerous armies, Melchizedek, after repeating to me the words spoken by the Messiah, said a sign that would be important for those who lived for the occasion of the great liberation of Israel. He affirmed that, multiplying the 144 pearls of tithing by the number of columns in his palace, he would find a year that would bring to his consummation the great liberation of Israel. Moved by curiosity, I immediately began to count the columns, they were forty marble columns, adorned with precious stones. Two upon returning to the king with the result of the calculations, he began making predictions about the great events that would take place at the end of that year. 3a When the fullness of time arrives, all human efforts in search of peace will be frustrated. At that time, numerous nations will ally themselves against the kingdom of Salem, there will be a battle like never before and the whole earth will be punished by fire, after exhausting them all the resources in their defense, Israel will see, with despair, countless enemies marching against them, with the purpose of eliminating them. Like Lot on their night of anguish, they will see their hope die, when, in Rosh Hashanah, the harmonious chords of a lute, played by a Bedouin from the tribe of Tamireth, must be heard in the middle of the ruins of Salem, his music will revive faith and hope in a better world, where nation will not rise against nation, where tears, pain, and death will no longer exist. For after comforting the afflicted with the cords of his lute, the Bedouin will take the vase with the scrolls of David's grave, and carry it on his shoulders. On that day, his feet will be on the Mount of Olives, and, crying out for the liberation of Israel, there will be a strong earthquake that will crack the Mount in half, emerging from the east to the west a huge valley. On that day, all the land of Israel will be heavily shaken, ensuing a total destruction for all enemy armies, there will, however, be salvation for all those who, with repentance, took refuge under the Eternal's wings, throwing away the instruments of violence. 5. All mankind will witness with horror the scenes of the liberation of the children of Israel. On that day, many peoples and powerful nations will be established next to Yahweh of armies, crowds of the diaspora Jews will approach, saying, We will go with you, because we know that the Eternal is on your side. 
6. The Yom Kippur that will follow liberation will be a day of purification of the impurities of all those who accepted salvation, on that day the blindness of the sons of Jacob will end, and they will look toward him whom they pierced, and they will cry bitterly for him as he cries for an only begotten son. 7. At the Feast of Sukkot, crops, the Spirit of God will be poured out on all flesh, and it will happen that, everyone who invokes the name of Yahweh will be saved, receiving a pearl from the vase. 8. In the decor of the days of Sukkot, rains of blessings will fall on the immense valley, causing a paradise full of joy and peace to appear in the sight of all the peoples, throughout the holy land. 9. On that day the elect of God will understand the words of the book. 10. Hear me, you, who seek justice, you who seek Yahweh. Look to the rock from which you were dug, to the cave from which you were taken. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, the one that you he gave birth, he was alone when I called him, but I blessed him and multiplied him, Yahweh comforted Zion, comforted all his ruins, he will transform his desert into an Eden and his solitude into a garden, where he will find joy and joy, thanksgiving chants and music sounds. 11 On that day the redeemed will look toward the humble Bedouin who freed Abraham's vase from the cave, and will sing with joy. Wait. 12 How beautiful they are, on the mountains, the feet of the messenger who announces peace, of the one who proclaims good news and announces salvation, of the one who says to Zion. I keep saying the Bedouin. <laughs> Excuse me. Um... If I'm not mistaken, the preface had, you know, went into this big old ordeal about how it was a blessing that the Dead Sea Scrolls was found by those Bedouins. I don't know what they was doing, but they was digging in caves. But anyway, um. I don't remember them saying what kind of vase they found it in. <laughs> you know, they say they found it in some old pottery, but, um. I don't remember if they mentioned anything special about the vase they found it in or if Abraham was putting his scrolls in the exact same vase because that vase is still holding pearls, right? So maybe he got another vase. I don't know. But Oh, your God reigns. Because Yahweh comforted his people, he redeemed Jerusalem. Yahweh discovered his holy arm in the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. 13. For six years, all mankind illuminated by the greater revelation of Yahweh's love and justice, will have the opportunity to break with the empire of sin, joining the children of Israel in their march of purification and restoration of the kingdom of light. 14 Then it will happen that all the survivors of the nations that marched against Shut Jerusalem up, will on. rise, year after year, to prostrate themselves before King Yahweh of armies, and to celebrate the Feast of Sukkot. And it will happen that the one among the families of the earth who does not come up and does not come, will attract against herself the plague with which Yahweh will hurt the nations that do not come up to celebrate the Feast of Sukkot. 15. In those years of opportunity, the last treat of mercy will sound throughout the world, in an attempt for all sinners to repent and unite in an eternal alliance with Yahweh, saying, 16. Thus says Yahweh, observe the right and practice justice, because my salvation is ready to come and my justice, to manifest. Blessed is the man who proceeds in this way, and the son of the man who affirms this, who keeps the Sabbath and do not desecrate him and he keeps his hand from practicing evil. Don't tell the foreigner that he gave himself to Yahweh, naturally Yahweh is going to exclude me from his people, or say the eunuch, there is no doubt, I do not pass a dry tree, Thus says Yahweh to the eunuchs who keep my Saturdays and opt for what is my will, remaining faithful to my covenant I must give them, in my house and within my walls, a monument and a name more precious than they would have as sons and daughters. Another weird line. Now, know any of y'all Bible thumpers or whatever, you know, I know you possibly got y'all feelings about eunuchs. <laughs> I, I really don't got no emotions about it or whatever, it's just... Something that I don't think about on a regular basis. But since we, yeah. Probably about to smell this. No, that's unique. <laughs> uh, I don't even think I spelled that right. Yep, there you go. Um, ain't got no deeper definitions. Oh, that's because it's Bing. Um, 
A man who has been castrated through the history of castration often served as a specific social function. And they leaving it real simple right there. There you go. I want to click that. Anyway, you know, they used to use eunuchs or psychics, right? It wasn't just domination all the time. Yeah, sometimes they castrate somebody just to dominate them. But other times they try to find that balance center line between the male female energy and they castrate a man, you know, get him more into the feminines, this, that and the other. I'm about to be pissed. Oh, it was a restart. That's cool. Online gaming. It's a different world. Anyway, so yeah, they used to use them for psychic powers, this, that, and the other, or whatever. So it's crazy. I, I don't know what that means. That could be bad psychic powers. That could be good psychic powers, you know. Um, you ain't supposed to do the divinations, this, that, and the other. Saul did it. And that Samuel? Yeah, Samuel came from the grave to, to tell Saul, like, hey, bro, you tripping. So therefore, it's, it still had an act or whatever, you know. And I don't remember too much damnation on the woman who conjured him up. You know, she was just mentioned and conversation continued, you know. So, um, eunuchs, special st statue in heaven. Ooh, weird. I ain't here to judge, man. I'm, I'm on the lower level. Things are deeper, you know. I don't know the good or the bad. I have to give them an eternal name, which will not be removed. And, as for foreigners who surrender to Yahweh to serve him, yes, to love the name of Yahweh and become his servants, namely, all who refrain from desecrating the Sabbath and who remain faithful to my covenant, I will bring you to my holy mountain and cover you with joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be well accepted on my altar. In effect, my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. 17 In the six years of opportunity, Samael, the great deceiver, in a gesture of despair, will use all possible resources to prevent the realization of Yahweh through his people. In opposition to the sanctification of the Sabbath which is the sign of the covenant between Yahweh and his chosen ones, numerous religions, allied to impious rulers, will impose another day for worship, not being able to buy or sell all those who remain faithful to the covenant of Yahweh in those years of trials, the elect of God will survive by caring for the angels, who will lead them away from the populous cities that will be punished for the last seven plagues that will fall on the unrepentant at the end of the six years. 18 During the six years of the final harvest, the Messiah will build a new and eternal Jerusalem, adorning it with the acts of justice of his elect. That new Jerusalem will only be revealed when all divine justice is completed, at the end of the seventh year, a period in which the elect of God will have as a challenge to live a life without guilt, since any act of rebellion at that time would be without atonement, meaning a eternal shame for the Creator. 19 At the end of the seven years, the Messiah will appear in the clouds of heaven, accompanied by all the heavenly hosts, by playing his trumpet on that great Rosh Hashanah, the deceased faithful will rise in glory, the victorious living will be transformed in the blink of an eye, receiving perfect bodies, together, all the redeemed will be raptured into the new Jerusalem, on an unforgettable journey that will begin on the first day of the Sukkot festival, after seven days. I'm still listening, y'all, my bad. But that's crazy. I kind of want to see all the fine details. But unknown artist Melchizedek, Abraham, Moses, Sam... That's David Sam. I'm looking for Sam Yazel. Sam Yazel was in the Melchizedek story, but it's not Samuel from um, Saul. So Samuel and David. So that'd be David. Anything weird? He got a spear. Why does he have a spear? What does the spear have to do with anything I know about David? Nothing. Samuel got a, uh, whatchamacallit. So who that is? Moses, why he got a bird? Why Moses got a bird? Somebody explain the bird. Is that a quail? And what's that animal underneath his feet? Is that the um 
the golden calf that he's standing on because he, you know, screw that junk. All right, this is Abraham and Isaac, no question. I don't know what that is. Melchizedek, that looks like a bowl. Got the bowl with the, um, whatchamacallit's on it? I don't know. But since it ain't showing me the right Samuel, I'm going I'm to have to let it go and keep rolling. What am I looking at? Life of Miriam. Y'all doing some stuff. <laughs> Ascension. They will arrive in the holy city to commemorate, before the throne, the eighth day of the party. As if it were a dream, the rescued of the Lord will enter the holy city, finding on their north side, the Garden of Eden, in the middle of which Mount Zion rises, the place of Yahweh's throne. Crowned by the Messiah, the redeemed will sing the song of victory, making the chords of their harps, lutes and flutes vibrate throughout the space. Chapter 8 Melchizedek's predictions continue. Abraham and his shepherds proclaim the salvation represented by the history of the vase and its redemptive flame. They grant pearls to believers. A time of opportunity before the calamity. Excuse me. The pearls of the vase did not have meaning to Sarah. One after hey, other in all How these predictions, Melchizedek told me that all the experience we were living was prefigurative. Into this For the point. whole drama to be consummated, we still had important events ahead of us. First, I should return to the Mamre Oak together with my shepherds, to proclaim to all the salvation represented by the history of that vase. Anyone who with repentance, accepted the revealed Messiah, would obtain forgiveness of their sins, receiving a pearl. At the end of six years, on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the Rosh Hashanah. pearls would be finished, there being no more chance of salvation. At that time, the fire of judgment would fall on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, with terrible plagues upon all the infidels. Too when I heard such words from the king of Salem, great anguish came upon me, when I remembered Sarah's last steps, I feared that she, in her disbelief, would not accept a pearl. If this happened, my beautiful dreams would fall to the ground, because I would not be happy in his absence. Reading in my eyes the anguish, Melchizedek comforted me with a promise. 3A Abram, six years from now Yahweh will visit you in your store, and your wife will be cured of her sterility. She will convert and give you a son named Isaac. For at the end of the Sukkot party, we returned to our stores next to the Mamre Oak. As we went along the road, many people surrounded us, admired by the beauty of the vase full of pearls, we all told the story of his redemptive flame, and offered the pearls to all who, believing, accepted salvation. 5. When we arrived at the Mamre Oak, a crowd of people waited for him. Many had heard of the miraculous liberation operated through that vase that had been the target of so much contempt. Now, everyone was muted to see him glorified. 6. Together with my pastors, we continue to proclaim the infinite love of Yahweh revealed by the flame. The number of those who sought pearls was increasing, day after day, and we were all happy. 7. The days, months, and years went by, and the amount of pearls was decreasing inside the vase. We were living now the last months of the sixth year, which was the last chance. As the days went by, a worry and anguish increased in my heart, for Sarah had not taken interest in seizing her pearl in spite of my constant pleas. Eight in those moments of affliction in which I cried out to God for the salvation of Sarah, my only consolation was the last words of the king of Salem, that at the end of the six years she would be transformed. 9. We lived now the last days of the sixth year, the awareness that time was running out, made many people procure me from morning to night, to seize the pearls of salvation. With my heart wounded by inexpressible affliction, I insisted with Sarah, trying to convince her of her need to take, as soon as possible, a pearl, because they were becoming Wait, scarcer what? every day. Regardless of my anguish, Sarah disdained my requests. Sorry, that just listening here and then i read that sentence and it short-circuited me for a second so i was like wait a second wait what am i doing i'm looking for that bowl the vase y'all y'all already know the grape 
pearl what, i'm sorry y'all the, the pearl of great price contains the book of moses the book of abraham the prophet joseph smith inspired translation of matthew what the fees it chapter oh mormon beliefs that's a book okay y'all had me thinking i mean all right I don't know what else to call it. Ancient. I should have put ancient before the pearl. Where that's from? That's Etsy. Y'all biscuits. I guess it could be of a battle. Okay, what that is? Uh, you can't see what these things got on them. It's not even real. That looks like some ancient stuff. But either way, it'd have it'd have art on. Uh, anybody find any good wisdom on that? Y'all let me know, because I am curious about that vase. If it was such a big deal, you figure, you know, there'd be some kind of way of preservation. Da, 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 da. Or at least a little story somewhere. That's probably something I want to read. <clears throat> Abraham's they just gonna talk about Abraham and the king. Abraham is the king. You know what I'm saying? I want to see the word king. That's the easy way to find it. <laughs> Abraham meets the king of priests, not Melchizedek. Let's get back to the story, y'all. My bad. Distractions. Affirming that those pearls had no meaning for her. Chapter 9. Abraham tries to convince Sarah without success. Abraham receives three pilgrims with hospitality. The Lord converts Sarah and blesses him, gives him two pearls, one for her and one for his son. Abraham falls at the feet of his Redeemer and receives the last pearl. One after a sleepless night in which, desperately, I tried to convince my beloved to take possession of her pearl, accepting the salvation represented by that vase, I saw the sun rise bringing the light of the last day a the eve of Rosh Hashanah. Looking into the vase that morning, I saw that there were barely three pearls left. When I admired the brightness, I began to imagine that the brightest would be for my promised son, that of intermediate brightness would be Sarah's, and the last one would be mine. That thought brought me relief and hope, but, at the same time, I began to worry about the possibility of people arriving trying to the get them, stuff. if they came, I could not deny them the right to them. Too taken by that concern, I sat under the Mamre Oak. During the day, a great shudder came upon me when I saw in the distance three pilgrims walking towards our shop. I began to cry out to God that they change course, but my cries were not answered. Dominated by great bitterness. Bible, you read it. Oh, I'm happy to see them. Come on, good company. Man, I can't wait to see people. I'm Abraham. I'll be chilling. Right here is like, look, I'm dealing with a uh, sterile wife. You know what I'm saying? I just got back from bat battle not too long ago. A lot of stuff going on in my head. Them three dudes walking in my direction. Go away. <laughs> Bother me not. You know? 
I ran to them, and, after prostrating myself, invited them into the shadow. He's Three still faking a vase with water. I be He's still faking after prostrating myself. Yeah, he's still faking. He's just doing hospitality or whatever because they said they went to Abraham's shop. Mm. Mm. If we said he wasn't trading, we'd be lying. Began to wash their feet, cleaning them from the dust of the road. Seeing the wounded and blistered feet of those men, I felt compassion for them. I understood that they had come from far away, facing dangers and challenges, in order to get the pearls on time. I saw that they were much more deserving than me, Sarah and our promised son. For by washing the feet of the third, my heart that until then was afflicted, was filled with peace and joy, I imagined at that time, how terrible it would be if that third pilgrim had not joined the first two on that journey, in that case I would be obliged to take the last pearl, climbing without my beloved Salem. If I had to go through that experience, the pearl that symbolized the joy of salvation, would become for me a symbol of loneliness and sadness, because the long life of Sarah's affection would be for me the greatest punishment, like my own death. 5. After washing their feet, I began serving them the food that was specially prepared for them. While serving them in silence, I was waiting for the moment when they would ask me about the pearls. But without revealing any hurry, they talked about the long walk they made. And he ain't said nothing about them being angels or messengers from God. In the Bible, he saw that from way over there. Nah, he didn't wash feet and everything. Still just some cats, but you know, I got compassion for him. About the cities they had passed through. I asked them if they knew Salem. They answered me affirmatively, adding that in those six years, many works had been carried out in that city, in preparation for a great party that was about to take place in another year, for the occasion of Sukkot. Six the words of that third pilgrim, the most talkative of the three, began to bring me, mysteriously, a feeling of hope. Looking into his blue eyes, I saw that he looked like Melchizedek. I ain't hate, but you see they keep pushing the blue eyes thing. You know, I wonder if that has a whole different meaning. Or are they just saying blue eyes to throw it in your face, because otherwise... Not really, no need to even mention it. <laughs> it seems like, you know, certain things. I don't know who got the Dead Sea Scrolls before they let us read them. I can imagine a couple of people. Seven, I remembered the last promise made by the King of Salem, when the third pilgrim asked me with a smile. Eight, A. Abram, where is Sarah your wife? Nine, stunned, I asked him. Ten, how do you know my name and my wife's name? 11 The Pilgrim replied. 12 Not only do I know your names, but I also know that, within a year, you will have a son who will be called Isaac. 13 When I heard the words of the visitor, I ran into the store to call my wife, to hear the words of the pilgrim. 14 When he saw her, the pilgrim asked him. 15 Sarah, why are you laughing at my words? 16 Scared, Sarah replied. 17. I did not laugh my lord. 18a don't say you didn't laugh, because I saw you laughing inside the store. The pilgrim affirmed. 19. I conscious saw you of being in front of someone Abraham who knew his interior, in. Sarah asked him. 20. Who are you lord? 21. I am the flame that broke away from the fire of the altar to be in your husband's face. I am the messiah the Yahweh who suffers humiliation and contempt for love of his people. 22 Having made this revelation, the pilgrim extended his hands over Sarah's head to bless her, only until then I saw that they were marked by scars similar to those of the king of Salem. Twen now he said the Yahweh to save mankind, or whatever, whatever he said, I'm sorry. But um, earlier didn't it say a God who would separate themselves from Yahweh? Or a suffering Messiah that will separate himself from Yahweh. I mean, I, I, a lot of aspects. The pilgrim, with much tenderness, began to speak to the heart of my beloved, rescuing her from her cave of disbelief. 24. Sarah, you are valuable in my eyes. 
All your past of disbelief and infertility is forgiven. I have a glorious future for you, for you will become the mother of many peoples and nations. 25 After saying these words, the noble visitor went to the vase and, bowing, took from him the three remaining pearls. Addressing Sarah, he handed her two pearls, and said, 26 A one is for you and the other is for your son Isaac. 27 With life transformed by Yahweh's love, Sarah prostrated herself at the feet of the pilgrim who had saved her at the last moment of opportunity. When I saw her prostrate submissive, my heart for so many years afflicted, it broke into tears of joy and gratitude, and I yes. fell at the feet of my Redeemer and King. 28 After comforting us with the certainty of our eternal salvation, the pilgrim handed me the last pearl. When I squeezed it in my hands I felt a great light of joy and peace penetrate my whole being, and I began to praise the Eternal for the certainty that I would forever have my dear Sarah and the son of the promise that, within one year would be born. Chapter 10 Abraham accompanies the Lord to the hill from where the Lord sends his two companions on a mission. Yahweh laments the destruction that will come to the inhabitants of the cities of that beautiful valley. Abraham intercedes for that people. There were not ten righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. Yahweh's Lamentation The two companions are sent to rescue Lot and his daughters. Abraham prostrates himself thankful to Yahweh for the intervention in the rescue of his relatives. One after these things. Okay. You see this, this is a long book, so we're just going to piece it up. <clears throat> you know, so. Uh, a lot of weird points. Ain't even got to the crazy stuff yet. Over here is like the junk that I wish they would have continued further. Right here is all Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. No, Adam, Eve, and Cain. Abel don't even come in. It's Adam, Eve, Cain. And it shows the struggle they tried to get Cain to the light. It wasn't just he grew up and decided God wasn't cool. You know, it's a whole dramatic story through his childhood. It's, it's, it's pretty dope, no lie. But all right. Like I said, I'm going to try to get back to this. Getting back to breaking down the videos from my perspective, viewpoints. Um, got some books in the mail, you know read some stuff but you know just get back to mentally building you know and i always enjoy the commentary back and forth good people y'all take care of yourself off the sky i'm looking for this button i ain't looking at y'all